All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Jonathan Ostis with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Plant Protection Division. I am the Emerald Ash Borer Technical Assistance Coordinator. Uh, and with me this morning is Danielle DeVito. She's the Plant Pest Regulatory Coordinator and handles all things uh, Emerald Ash Borer uh, regulatory related. And we're going to give a kind of broad overview uh, of the issue. Uh, I am recording this meeting, so it will be available in the next couple of days uh, after this. If you know anybody that wasn't able to attend that would uh, benefit from this information, I will post a link on our MDA Emerald Ash Borer website uh, once it's ready in, to go um, and post it on YouTube. So I'm going to get started here. If at any time you have questions, please uh, put them into the chat as we go along. We'll either address them as we go along or at the at the end of the presentation, we'll cover it. So with that, I'm going to get started. Uh, just our agenda real quick here is the life cycle of the insect, the host trees, uh, how to recognize the, the insect itself, uh, the signs and symptoms. So the damage you'll see in trees that you want to be able to spot early. Uh, the distribution throughout the state of Minnesota, the known distribution, the regulations, and then uh, the options for management, and then finally, uh, how to report new infestations. So um, just a little bit of background here. Uh, emerald ash borer is a, is a metallic wood borer and beetle that native range is kind of northeastern Asia, so parts of China, the Russian Far East, Mongolia, Japan, uh, North and South Korea, and Taiwan. It likely arrived in North, Mer North America sometime in the early to mid 90s, and it wasn't identified as an issue until 2002 in the Detroit, Michigan area. So it was it's thought that it was likely brought in on solid wood packaging material into the port there, into the port of entry. And it, for probably about a decade, it went undetected. And, um, you know, in 2002, they saw that there were thousands of dead and dying ash trees throughout the area. And at that point, uh, lots of infested firewood and ash nursery stock had been shipped to other locations around the country, kind of kicking off that rapid spread of this insect throughout North America. So at this point, uh, we now have emerald ash borer in 38 states and five Canadian provinces. So it's throughout a good chunk of, of North America. It was first identified in Minnesota in 2009. So uh, it's been nearly 15 years since it was first identified there in the South St. Anthony Park neighborhood of St. Paul. And we are now at uh, 48 counties with known infestations. So it keeps ticking up and it's starting to move pretty rapidly here. All right. So that's kind of the background of this insect. And so we're having this meeting today due to the recent find of emerald ash borer in Crow Wing County uh, in, in the Brainerd area. And so the life cycle of this insect is um, kind of important to understanding how, how it works and how you have to deal with it. So the, the adult beetles are active. Uh, what we term the, the active period is May through September. So uh, they begin emerging. Uh, kind of depends on how quickly things warm up in the spring. But uh, usually uh, in central Minnesota, it's late May or early June when you start getting an initial emergence. Once they emerge from the tree, uh, they begin doing a little bit of maturation feeding in the in the canopy of the tree on the leaves. So they they nibble on the leaves for several days or a week. Uh, it's nothing that you'd notice with your with the naked eye. It's not like Japanese beetle, which skeletonizes a leaf. So uh, it's not something you're going to pick up. So after they do that maturation feeding, they then find a mate. They mate, and then uh, within a few days, they begin laying eggs in the bark cracks and crevices uh, in the upper canopy of the tree. So emerald ash borer starts in the top of the tree and works its way down. They're typically going to begin laying their eggs in those branches between two to six inches in diameter, uh, where that bark transitions from smooth to rough. And so, and typically they begin laying their eggs on the south or southwest facing side of the tree. So the side of the tree that gets the most amount of direct sunlight. Once those eggs, uh, and I'll mention too that the, the female beetles lay uh, on average between 60 to 90 eggs in their lifetime, but can lay upwards of over 200 eggs. So uh, you can see how that population starts to build quite quickly. Uh, once those eggs are laid within a week or two, uh, they will hatch. And then those small larvae will then burrow through the bark and begin uh, tunneling in that cambium layer of the tree. So this is where the insect does the damage to the tree. It's They, they feed in that cambium layer. And so they disrupt uh, the transfer of nutrients between the root system and the crown. So as those lar larvae begin tunneling, uh, they go through what we call larval instar stages, and that's basically just growing sizes. So they go through four growing stages. 
uh, before they then will chew a pupil chamber, uh, either about a quarter inch into the sapwood or in really large mature trees with thick bark, they'll do it into the bark as well. And so you can see in that center picture there, that's a, a larva that has chewed its pupil chamber. It's now folded over and it's ready uh, for when it heats up again the next spring and summer to pupate and turn into the adult and start that process all over again. So emerald ash borer has a one year and a two year life cycle in Minnesota. Uh, the further north you go with the shorter growing season, the, the long, uh, more two year life cycles you tend to have. And so to give you an example of that, um, emerald ash borer egg that was laid in the summer of 2023, it hatched, the larva made it partway through its larval development before going dormant for this, this winter. Uh, this next spring and summer, when it heats up again, it will finish its larval development and make its way to its pupil chamber. It will overwinter a second time and then emerge as an adult beetle in the summer of 2025. So you can really have uh, any stage of immature larvae underneath the bark at any time of year, which makes it an important feature for uh, transporting things like firewood. Um, so it's, 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 um, it's, it's just good to know how that life cycle works. All right, so as I kind of mentioned, how emerald ash borer kills trees. So uh, a tree can withstand an attack from a, a couple beetles. Um, it's really once the number of beetles that build up in the tree and the number of larvae uh, tunneling underneath the bark in that cambium layer that, that does the damage to the tree. So you go from a few infesting the tree and then you know over several years, you end up having thousands of beetles infesting the tree. And you have gallery on top of gallery and it effectively girdles the tree and this is also why the insect begins infesting a tree in the mid to upper canopy and works its way down because if they started on the trunk of the tree, they would girdle that tree a lot faster and uh, use up that food source. And so you can just see a, a picture representation here of a street in Ohio that uh, was devastated by emerald ash borer and had lots of trees dying in a very short period of time. And so that gets to why it's such a big issue. So. Uh, emerald ash borer is a pretty cryptic insect, and unfortunately, you don't start to see the symptoms in a tree until it's been present for several years. And so what you find is typically emerald ash borer populations grow slowly in those first few years. But once you, you start to hit that population explosion, within a couple years of that, uh, you have kind of a mass tree mortality in a short period of time. So this is what really uh, causes a lot of issues in, in cities and communities that have to manage a large number of trees you have a lot of trees dying in a short amount of time. So uh, the earlier you can detect uh, emerald ash borer populations earlier on in that curve, uh, the better outcomes you're gonna have for your management activities in reducing that population and slowing and making it take longer until you get to that point where you have uh, a population explosion, lots of trees dying in a short amount of time. All right, so host trees. So what uh, emerald ash borer attacks? It's all true ash trees. So anything in the Fraxinus species, uh, ash trees have opposite branching, uh, compound leaves, and five to many leaflets, depending off its black, white, or green ash. And so you can see kind of that uh, diamond ridge bark there and those compound leaves. And then a lot of communities will wrap uh, a gr big, large green tree wraps around ash trees to kind of draw attention to it in their community so citizens can pick out an ash tree easily. So um, the host trees we have three types of ash that are native to Minnesota. Uh, it's black ash, green ash, and white ash, and they're all highly susceptible to emerald ash borer. It's about a 99% mortality rate. Um, so uh, we, we find green ash throughout the entire state. That's the most common tree planted in yards, in right-of-ways, in shelter belts, uh, in parks. Uh, we have a small amount of native white ash in the more upland areas and some eastern uh, pockets of the state. And then we have black ash that's found throughout two thirds of the state. And a lot of that in the north central Minnesota where we have large swaths of black ash forest. Um, and that's where the bulk of our ash resource comes from. Uh, we have nearly a billion ash trees in the state. So we have the most out of any state in the lower 48. Uh, so we have a, a really massive resource that's uh, under attack at this point. And in communities, typically it's about one, uh, one out of five trees is an ash tree in a community. Uh, as you get into more uh, of the cities in the western part of the state, uh, that number climbs up to one out of three or one out of every two trees that are an ash tree that are planted in their community. So um, this is going to impact uh, everyone. And unfortunately, um, we didn't diverse enough, diversify enough in our replantings after uh, Dutch elm disease came through in the 70s and 80s. 
And a lot of uh, those locations were replanted with green ash. And so we're now kind of facing that same that same assault. Uh, so uh, the best way to recognize emerald ash borer. Uh, there's really four ways to identify it. Uh, the main one is that S-shaped feeding gallery. So they make a very distinct tunneling pattern. It is the only insect in ash that will create that tunneling pattern. So if you find an S-shaped feeding gallery on the surface of that wood in that cambium layer, uh, in an ash tree, you know it's emerald ash borer. It's the only insect that will do that in ash. We have other native insects, pests, like bronze birch borer that'll do that in birch trees. Uh, but if you find that S-shaped feeding gallery in an ash tree, you know you have emerald ash borer. Uh, next is to the right is the emerald ash borer larva itself. So what's distinct about that is what's circled there in red. Uh, it has two little spine-like projections. It's called the urogomphy. They're two little black pincers at the tail end of the larva. If you pull an insect larva out of an ash tree and it has those two little black pincers at the tail end, you know it's emerald ash borer. It's the only one in ash that will have that. Uh, there's other native insects that'll have one of those or none of them, but if you have those two little black pincers at the tail end, you know it's emerald ash borer if it was pulled out of an ash tree. Uh, next is the adult beetle itself. So this isn't quite as common to see. Uh, usually it's up in the canopy of the tree, but as infestation levels get really high in an area, you may come across it more often. Uh, but they are very distinct looking. They're about a half inch long by about an eighth inch wide. Uh, they have those bright iridescent green uh, wing covers. And then they have that kind of deep red or magenta colored abdomen. Uh, so they are very distinct looking, but it, it, you don't come in contact with them quite as often. And then lastly is the D-shaped exit hole. So they leave a very distinct uh, shape of an exit hole when they exit a tree. And it has that D-shaped and that flat side is either on the top or the bottom when they exit the tree. Um, it, this is the worst thing to look for because if you're able to see a D-shaped exit hole at eye level, the, you, if you looked up in the tree, you should see a lot of other damage that would let you know that that tree's infested. Um, there's other insects that leave oval-shaped exit holes that can look kind of similar. So in general, it's not a great thing to look for if you're trying to look for emerald ash borer in a tree, uh, especially because you know the, the adult beetles themselves are only an eighth inch wide. So if you're looking at a really large tree with thick bark, that's going to be very, very tough to spot. So uh, really, you're going to going to be wanting to look up uh, for the reasons I'm about to mention about what to look for early on and look for those S-shaped feeding galleries. All right, and then here's some uh, common uh, insects that are commonly confused with emerald ash borer. You can see up on the top left is emerald ash borer itself circled there. Um, the most common thing we get uh, reported is the six spotted tiger beetle. Uh, it's also kind of that bright iridescent green, and oftentimes you'll see it on the ground, on the sidewalk, on your deck, someplace like that. It's a ground nesting beetle. Um, that That is the most common one confused, and often we get a lot of reports in late May through June. Uh, so if you're seeing a, a bright green bug running across the ground or just hanging out down there, chances are that's what you're seeing, not, not emerald ash borer. All right, so what you want to look for to detect emerald ash borer as early as possible in a tree. So we really depend on woodpecker feeding damage. It's the number one thing that we can look for to identify uh, emerald ash borer in an area. So once they find emerald ash borer as a food source, they really can start to go to town and let you know where, where that insect is uh, infesting trees. So woodpeckers love to feed on insect larvae underneath the bark in general. So there's a couple of distinct features that make a uh, it look a certain way when we're looking for emerald ash borer damage in an ash tree. So like I mentioned before, uh, emerald ash borer typically starts in that mid to upper canopy on the south southwest facing side of the tree. Uh, so usually you're going to see some blonde patches where woodpeckers have flecked off some of that outer bark. And then you'll see these small dime sized light colored oval shaped woodpeck holes in those blonded areas. So they're just going deep enough uh, below beneath the bark to get to that insect larva. Uh, we have other native insects that a lot of time will burrow further into the into the heartwood of a tree and woodpeckers will still go after them, but they will leave more of a shadow because they have to go so much deeper to get to it. And so, um, and another good rule of thumb is if you only see woodpecker damage on the base of the tree, on the trunk of the tree and nothing in the canopy, that's also a good sign that it's probably not emerald ash borer. Uh, because emerald ash borer begins infesting a tree in the mid to upper canopy and works its way down. So you should have damage in both locations if that's what's occurring. 
And so it leaves this very distinct uh, shallow woodpeck holes. And here's some more examples of that. Uh, you can see those blonde patches in that photo on the left with those little shallow woodpeck holes in there. Uh, if you're looking for it, right now is a great time to look for it. Uh, we do our survey when the leaves are off the trees, so throughout the winter time. And uh, things can change pretty rapidly once the woodpeckers find emerald ash borer as a food source. So uh, coming back you know, a few weeks later, it can, can make a big difference. And then in the center there is kind of a, a poor photo, but that's of a black ash tree. Um, you can kind of see those light colored marks. Those are all woodpecked areas. Uh, it just doesn't quite show up as well. The contrast isn't as good due to the, the bark color. And then in the photo on the right is a heavily infested green ash tree in a park where uh, once that tree is really heavily infested, you're gonna see woodpecker damage all the way down to the base of the tree with the bark starting to fall off. Another thing to look for are bark splits. So when that ash tree is initially infested by emerald ash borer, it will try to heal around that, that feeding wound, so that tunneling gallery. And so it will compartmentalize that wound and start to build callus tissue. And as that tree continues to grow, that callus tissue builds up and that bark detaches from the surface of the wood where that feeding gallery was and creates a nice vertical split in the bark where you can oftentimes see that S-shaped gallery on the surface of the wood. Uh, in the picture on the right there, it's a little less obvious, but you can see that bark vertically splitting there as well. And more examples of that, you can see kind of more zoomed out picture of uh, long ver uh, vertical cracks going up the main stem of a tree. And then if you look really closely in this photo on the right, in the top center, you can actually see a split with part of a, a gallery within that split. So it can be uh, kind of cryptic looking, but if you look closely, you, you can see it. All right, and lastly, canopy thinning. So unfortunately, this usually doesn't become readily apparent to most people until the tree is pretty far gone. Um, what you're gonna see is an overall thinning of the canopy, uh, fewer leaves, smaller leaves, a lot more light penetrating through the canopy. And oftentimes what you'll see is that picture on the right where you get that thinning canopy on the outside and you start to get a lot of epicormic sprouting or sucker sprouts along the, the main stem in the lower part of the canopy, making it, giving it a real bushy appearance with that real light ca thin canopy on the outside. So that is a very common look that you'll see of an of a infested tree. And so the general progression of symptoms uh, is, on average, it takes about five years from emerald ash borer initially infesting a tree to killing the tree completely. Um, this can go faster once it, uh, insect pressure in an area is very high, or it can take a little bit longer if it's kind of the initial uh, trees that are being infested in an area. Uh, but on average, this is about how it goes. So in that first year of infestation, uh, there's just small larvae present under the bark. There's no outward signs that you'd see that, that yet your tree is infested. The only way to identify in that year one of infestation is by doing what we call branch sampling. And that requires removing uh, two, three foot sections of branch from the mid canopy um, and then peeling the bark off to look for larvae underneath. So that's that's pretty labor intensive to find in that year one. Uh, in that second year of infestation, you have large larvae present. You have more emerald ash borer building up in that tree. Uh, if it's possible, the woodpeckers will find that food source at that point, and you may see a few spots in the canopy if you're paying really close attention. At this point, if the tree was otherwise a healthy tree, you're still not seeing really any canopy decline at that point in that year two. Uh, it's really in year three that you're likely to see uh, woodpecker damage and those bark splits. You have more emerald ash borer building up in that tree. Uh, if you know what to look for, you should be able to spot it in that year three of infestation. Uh, typically, there isn't a whole lot of canopy decline at that point as well either. Uh, it's really once you get into that year four where those canopy impacts become very visible to the average homeowner. Uh, so really, in the wintertime, you want to be keeping an eye out for woodpecker feeding damage in, in the canopy of your ash trees. Uh, so once we get to that year four, um, you're seeing those visible canopy uh, thinning. Uh, you got a lot more woodpecker damage maybe coming down onto the main trunk of the tree. At that point, your tr tree is probably too far gone and not treatable with insecticide to save it. So that's that's typically what we see as the cutoff. And then within a year or two after that, your tree is dead and on, on its way out. So it's really important to note that ash trees dry out quite quickly. It's why they make good firewood. Um, but that makes them quite hazardous and hard to deal with, and that can really increase removal costs depending on where that tree might be located in your yard. So um, if your tree is in an area where if it uh, dies and could uh, be hazardous to and fall on your property and do damage, um, you want to deal with it before it's completely dead. 
uh, because that really can increase removal costs. If your tree is uh, right next to your home, if it's a large tree and it's completely dead, they're going to have to bring in larger equipment, which can greatly increase that cost. So uh, moral of that story is try to deal with it before your tree is completely dead and, and a big hazard. So the distribution in the state of Minnesota. So what, where we know it's at. So this is our Emerald Ash Borer status map. You can see the URL at the top of the, of the screen. Um, we try to keep this as updated as quick as possible. So right now we, we're showing uh, there's 48 counties with known infestations. Uh, it shows the counties that are under Emerald Ash Borer quarantine there in red. And then I would uh, just point out the important part here is the Emerald Ash Borer generally infested areas. So that is a that is a polygon buffer that we put around confirmed infested tree locations to help better represent where emerald ash borer currently is doing damage to trees. So how like I mentioned that it takes a couple of years to begin to see uh, signs of infestation in a tree. Uh, emerald ash borer on average spreads one to two miles a year just on their own, not including any human assisted movement. So we're trying to better represent uh, where it is in an area. So if you're within a generally infested area, that means there's a high probability emerald ash borer is already impacting your tree, whether you see signs of infestation or not. So you should be taking action if you're within that generally infested area. And on a general rule of thumb, if you're within, you know, 10 to 15 miles of a known infested area and you don't want to potentially have any damage to your shade tree, you, that's a good time to start thinking about uh, insecticide treatment to protect your tree if, if that's something you want to do. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. And so just to zoom in here, um, you can see we've had new finds pop up to the north of Brainerd in, in uh, Cass County, so a little bit south of Reamer, and then over in Hackensack. Uh, we've also uh, had infestations pop up in Little Falls and in Genola in Morrison County to the south, and the recent finds uh, over uh, just east of Mora along 23 in Kadabek County. And so, and uh, in the southern part of Mille Lacs County in, in the town of Malacca. So it really is expanding. Um, if you're a community that uh, has to manage a large number of trees, you should be planning for its arrival uh, now. And and if you if you can st begin to reduce your, your ash resource that you're gonna have to manage. Uh, and just keep an eye out because uh, the earlier you can find it in your community, the better. And just to zoom in where it was found in Brainerd, so this is, uh, we found it doing uh, MDA early detection surveys. And uh, the, what we, the symptoms that we found was all within a, about a half mile of each other, uh, right there along uh, Southeast 13th Street um, and in that area right there. So kind of right in the middle of town. Um, so there could be other areas that we haven't picked up yet. Uh, there may be, you know, woodpecker damage may change throughout the winter and identify more trees and locations. Uh, so if you're in the Brainerd, if you live in Brainerd, consider the area generally infested and in that uh, emerald ash borer is likely beginning to impact your trees. So next up is regulations. I'm going to have Danielle hop on here and talk about that. Hey, thanks for joining us. I have been adding um, some links to some of the things that Jonathan was talking about over into the chat. If uh, it's a quick, grab it if you need it. Um, so my name is Danielle DeVito. I oversee uh, pest mitigation and all the regulations and quarantines when we place these in and work with businesses and communities and entities on compliance with it to work within these regulations. So uh, Jonathan is talking about how to find it and what it looks like, where it is, um, and some management strategies as well. I want to talk briefly about what the quarantines are, why do we do it, and what does that mean? Um, the main goal is just to slow that further progression. So we're restricting uh, material from leaving within those areas. And so that's what the quarantine really is. We're quarantining this area. You can't just freely move stuff out. And that's the idea to slow it down. So my job with those restrictions is to help you if you are a business to continue um, your job working within those regulations. And so we're really just facilitating that trade. Um, if you want to flip over in Minnesota, we have two. Oh, I see our internal one is not quite updated. It's constantly changing. Um, but we have two kinds of quarantines in Minnesota. We have our internal, which we're discussing with that Emerald Dash for in Crow Wing today. And that's done by the Department of Ag and we can different areas and everything is read on there. We also have an external quarantine and that external quarantine is going to restrict things from coming in from our outside borders. So all 
firewood and ash, um, ash materials, and that's coming in um, from Canada or any of our other borders. So we can really restrict that movement as well on potential pests. In Minnesota, with our EAB quarantine, what is regulated? Um, often people are like, oh, it's just firewood or it's just ash. Um, it is all parts of ash trees, the actual insect, all mulch because it gets commingled with so many different species, and then all hardwood firewood. So firewood is all hardwood that's less than four feet in length, which we'll keep talking about firewood too. It's most questions I get every, <laughs> every day, all the time. You know, flip over. So when we're talking about regulated articles, and I said all ash, that's the log and the branches, the stump, all parts of that ash tree are restricted. If you are hauling timber or you need to move it locations, it cannot leave that quarantine area without a compliance agreement uh, with the Department of Ag. A compliance agreement is an agreement with you as a business, municipality, an individual, with me as Department of Ag on how we're going to ensure that you're not, not further spreading that pest. Um, and so when we talk about those movements and what you can and can't do, I like the stoplight um, analogy because our quarantine is on red in those maps. Red is stop. You cannot leave those areas without an agreement. You can see some red arrows. Stop. You can't make that movement. You can't leave a quarantine and then you can't come in from the outside edges of our state from other places. Our yellow is our caution. Sometimes um, we need to move something from maybe that mid western part of our state and it needs to go to the eastern part. That's a move without with caution. Uh, you can only do that under normal traffic circumstances like stopping for fuel or construction, um, no kind of overnights. And then our green arrows are what is allowed without any kind of compliance. You can always move into a quarantined area. However, once you move that material in, it is now considered regulated. You can move around within a quarantined area on these products. And then we have that one that goes across the, the north of the diagonal there, um, showing that when you're outside of a quarantine, things are not restricted and they can also freely move around those regulated articles. So our ash, our firewood, our mulch. Um, as he mentioned, our map, and I did post a link. It was the last link. I put it in the chat there. And that is our EAB status. It's updated daily when we get um, new reports and new finds. And I always recommend if someone's like, wait, can I move that there? Uh, go here. It's a really good visual representation because you can zoom all the way in, punch in your address, punch in where you need to go, and it'll zoom you right into those areas to see if you are within those quarantined or not. So um, the compliance agreement, uh, again, I kind of mentioned that what that is, is a it's a one year agreement with someone and the Department of Ag and saying these are what we are going to do to ensure we are not spreading um, any kind of emerald ash borer farther, whether that's chipping to sizes or how we're moving our logs, um, heat treated for firewood, all those different things. And they move under those those certificate little seals on there. Once you sign those, that is agreed upon. Um, these are the options. If you are a tree care company and you are working in and out and around these areas, or you are a city who has your um, yard waste, compost, something like that, feel free to reach out to me. My contact will be in a few more slides. Um, but these are some of the things under that compliance agreement that we ensure businesses can continue to function and operate within these regulations that we outline to um, mitigate and kill Emerald Dashboard. Hot top question I get often is firewood. Um, firewood is the way it's defined is it's not just ash, it's all hardwood that's less than four feet in length. That's if it's split or not and for personal or commercial use. So the purpose for that is as firewood gets cut smaller, bark starts to fall off, um, it's easier for ash to be hidden into um, some of those mixed bundles. So that Let's, excuse me, my phone is ringing. Um, all of those, that's why we have that four foot rule on firewood. So it's all species. And then, so what can we do? What can we not do? Um, again, we have that exterior quarantine. So firewood cannot come in from Canada or any of the state borders. We're not leaving the EAB quarantine. It can't do that. So the red quarantined area can't leave those. And then on one of the maps, I know I, I forgot to mention if you saw up uh, along the North Shore in the Arrowhead region is Lake and Cook County. That's another pest. It's called the spongy moth. That is another quarantine. Um, but firewood can't leave those areas. What can firewood do? Again, thinking of those arrows and that stop sign, that stop light, uh, move around in a quarantine, move around outside. And then if you are going to uh, purchase firewood, 
that there's that certified safe to move seal that is firewood that has been heat treated in a kiln and certified by the Minnesota Department of Ag that it is pest free. So um, and always, you know, buy the wood local if you're going to burn it local. Um, if you are going to recreate and you're going to state forests or campgrounds, uh, DNR also has restrictions on what firewood can come into the park. And that is within the same county as the park or buying that MDA certified. So if you need firewood um, and you're looking and you want to make sure you get safe firewood, uh, look for that safe to move certified seal at our gas stations and retail locations. Here is my contact information. Take a picture, screen grab it, however you'd like. Uh, feel free to reach out. You can call or text. Um, that is my contact. If you have any questions about uh, moving any of that material or just uh, specifically on those regulations. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. You're welcome. All right, so just to drive that point home further, uh, we we use this. The you know here's a peat, an ash log with the bark on. There's no outward signs or symptoms on that log. You peel off the bark. Um, there's an in, there's an emerald ash borer gallery, but you still don't see an insect. Well, it's it's hidden right there into the sapwood, uh, ready ready to pupate and emerge at a new location. So. Uh, really, this is why we have the Don't Move Firewood campaigns. Uh, besides emerald ash borer, there's other pests that you could potentially transport and just get in the habit of uh, buying firewood where you're going to burn it. All right, so next up is management. Uh, I'm going to kind of briefly go over what the options are. Really, there's only a few options. Um, if you are a forest woodland owner, um, I highly encourage you to reach out to your uh, area DNR forester and begin working on a management plan uh, with, for your, your woodlot. Because um, this is basically going to cover what to do in a landscaped area, uh, so in, in your community, uh, in your yard, and things like that. All right, so uh, best management practices for emerald ash borer. So that the adult beetles are active from May to September. Uh, avoid, try to avoid doing removal of ash trees, uh, pruning of trees, uh, removal of stumps, or transporting that ash material around uh, during that, that flight period. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. So emerald ash borer oftentimes will reinfest the same tree that it emerged from or a tree right next to it. Oftentimes it doesn't go more than 100 meters from the tree that it emerged from. It's really just a small percentage of that population, uh, that insect population that will strike out long distances. And, and go a couple miles away. So uh, it is ideal if you can wait to do that work until the, the dormant period, so October 1st through April 30th. Uh, that is the best time to do any sort of pruning or removal of ash. Um, and this way you don't potentially have uh, beetles emerging from the load of wood as you transport it to wherever it's gonna be processed. Uh, but obviously things like storms and, and uh, you, know, you have to do work uh, sometimes during that flight period on ash. If you do, if you can leave the material at that location, so on site, or uh, chip it before you move it, or at the very least, cover your load as you transport it to wherever it's gonna be processed. That is ideal. Um, and then if at all possible, wait wait until those winter months to, to, to do any of that work uh, so you can deal with that wood and have it destroyed before you reach the, uh, the active period the following year. All right, so it comes down to really uh, tree removals or insecticide treatments. That's really the only way to deal with this pest. Um, when we're talking about tree removals, we're talking about maybe before emerald ash borer arrives, if you have a poor condition tree, uh, if it's poorly sited. So if your community la uh, managing a large number of ash trees, uh, starting to reduce the overall amount of ash you have uh, on city property is a good idea. Um, before emerald ash borer arrives. So uh, identifying those poor quality trees or those trees that are, are maybe at the end of their life uh, to begin uh, getting them down before emerald ash borer starts killing trees at a fast rate. Uh, once emerald ash borer is found, so having a sanitation program where you identify trees that's showing that woodpecker damage and making it a priority to remove those uh, during the winter months and destroying that material. Uh, trees that have the, that woodpecker damage have a higher uh, proportion of emerald ash borer within a tree uh, compared to a tree right next to it that has no symptoms. And then obviously you're gonna have to deal with dead trees because they're hazardous and they can fall and damage persons or property. Uh, if you're if you're in a, a more rural area where that tree doesn't pose a threat to, to property or, or human health, you can let that tree die and fall apart. 
Uh, as for treatments, uh, they are both preventative and therapeutic. Uh, it kind of depends on how much risk you're willing to take uh, as far as when you want to start treating your trees, if you want to keep them around. Uh, you can do treatments before emerald ash borer is known to be there. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, as a homeowner, if you don't want any uh, decline in your tr nice shade tree that gives you a lot of shade in the summertime on the south side of your house, uh, you're probably going to want to begin treating your tree before emerald ash borer is known to be in your community. Uh, and you can also treat trees after they're lightly infested. So the general rule of thumb is that as long as the tree has no more than 30% canopy decline, is still a healthy enough tree to uptake that chemical and fully protect the tree from emerald ash borer. So those that's kind of your basic options there. Um, what you want to think about, uh, like I mentioned, is how close is emerald ash borer known to be? Uh, it really has kicked into high gear here uh, with how long it's been present in the state now. Uh, we really have that population has exploded and there's been a long, a long time uh, for people to have uh, potentially accidentally moved infested material to new locations throughout the state. So it really is starting to pop up uh, uh, everywhere. So um, keep that in mind and, and be uh, you know very aware and, and pay attention to your trees, especially with the leaves off and when you can see that woodpecker damage. Other things you want to think about is how healthy is the tree to begin with? Uh, is it planted in a good location? Is it is it a large tree or is it a smaller tree that would be easy to cut down and replace with something else? Uh, how many trees do you have to deal with? So it, it, are all the mature trees on your property ash trees? You may not want to lose all those, so treatment may be more, more worth it. Uh, it really depends on the situation. If you have a really nice, large, mature tree that gives you a lot of benefits in your yard, uh, it may be cheaper in the short term or for the next 20 plus years to have that tree treated and maintain the benefits that it's giving before you'd ever reach that initial cost of removal. It kind of all depends on the situation uh, and how expensive it is it would be for that removal. Um, if you're a city managing a large number of trees, uh, usually, you know, not just doing one thing is is best. So, you know, doing removals identifying poor quality trees that are not worth saving and then identifying trees uh, that are worth keeping around to maintain a uh, mature canopy within your community. Uh, if you have mostly ash trees in, in a park, you could really lose the character of that park. So maybe treating key, uh, key specimens there. Uh, you can also use it as a management strategy. So treated trees do kill adult beetles, uh, can help reduce populations in, in a given area. So it can be a strategy. You may not plan to treat a tree for the life of it, but you may do it for a set amount of time so that you can uh, deal with having to remove and replace these ash trees over an extended period of time uh, instead of having them all die in a short period of time. So that, that can be a good uh, reason to treat as well. Uh, the treatment options available are systemic insecticides. So there's a few different types of chemicals available. Uh, hopefully Danielle can put that uh, homeowner's guide to insecticide selection here in the, in the chat for you. It's available on our website. And so, um, Really, there's there the chemicals are very effective as long as the tree is healthy enough to, to uptake the chemical and it's applied properly, your tree will be protected from emerald ash borer. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a once and done thing. Uh, it, it does have to be applied, reapplied every year or every other year, depending on the chemical that's used. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, tree care professionals will use um, the chemical amomectin benzoate to treat large mature ash trees. This is a restricted use uh, pesticide that's applied via trunk injection, and that's guaranteed for two years. Uh, if you're a city managing a large number of trees, you may be able to get away with a three year rotation of that chemical as well to make your resources stretch further. Um, so it's just important to know that um, to measure your tree, uh, the, the, there are chemicals available to, the, to homeowners to use to treat your tree for emerald ash borer. Uh, it's just important to read the label, uh, apply it properly, and make sure that the, the chemical you're, you're going to apply to treat your tree is rated for a tree your size. Um, there are a number of uh, homeowner options where that chemical is not rated for really large mature trees, so you don't want to be applying something um, that isn't fully protecting your tree. So really, uh, once you get into kind of over 15 inches or 48 uh uh, inches in circumference at four and a half feet above the ground, that's when we really suggest that you reach out to a tree care professional and have it professionally treated. On average, uh, for those professional treatments, it's about $10 a diameter inch. So you're looking at about 150 bucks every couple of years to keep your tree protected. And, you know, you know removal costs can get really high. So that, that could be um, 
a more uh, effective way to spend your money than uh, having to cut that tree down and then wait another 30 years to get something that size back. So it really depends on the situation, but the, the chemical treatments are effective. And if you have a large mature tree that you want to save, we really suggest reaching out to a tree care professional um, to, to be able to judge the health of the tree and apply the treatment properly. All right, so uh, just go to kind of wrap it up, management priorities, they're going to change as you go from an uninfested area to a heavily infested area. So it's really important when you're not known to have emerald ash borne in your area that you're planning uh, for it, coming up with a management plan that you, if you're a community, that you have an inventory, you know how much ash you have. So you know what the resource is and what you're going to have to deal with and where it's located. Uh, and then once emerald ash borer is found, it's treating high value trees, it's timely sanitation. So keeping up with removals. Uh, because eventually that population is is going to explode and you're going to have a lot of trees dying in a short amount of time. And then uh, after that, it's really once you're a heavily infested area, it's trying to minimize wood movement out of that area and safe disposal and utilizing that wood if you can. So using using the mulch uh, in, in planting projects and things like that. So uh, lastly, uh, reporting. Uh, now that you know what to look for and how how to identify emerald ash borer, uh, we we need your help with more eyes out around the state. Please report new potential infestations. And really, um, what we'd like you to do if you think you found one, uh, take pictures and and any notes of the details of what you're seeing. Uh, if you find an insect, please capture it and you know stick it in a, a plastic bag and put it in the freezer. Um, or, and then report it to either a local city forester uh, through Red Maps or most likely through our uh, MDA's report a pest. Uh, we have an email, we have an online form, and we also have a voicemail that you can call as well. And please let us know if you think you found something. Be very specific with the location. Uh, have an address or GPS coordinates if you can. And obviously pictures are very helpful that allow us for quicker follow-up to know what's going on. And lastly, I'll just mention, I uh, will be hosting some free Emerald Ash Borer Field Workshops in the month of March. Currently, I have two locations scheduled uh, for the second half of March. I will be in Brainerd at JC's Park on Tuesday, March 19th and March 20th. These are hour long sessions that really kind of give you a firsthand look at uh, emerald ash borer infested trees. And we cover we cover everything about emerald ash borer there in the field. They last about an hour, uh, so you have to dress for the weather. Um, they're only canceled due to severe weather. Um, I'll also be hosting them up in Dilworth, Minnesota, which is uh, basically Moorhead, Fargo area, uh, Tuesday, March 26th and Wednesday, March 27th. There's three sessions each of those days. You can go to our MDA website uh, if you'd uh, like to register for one of those. They're free and open to the public, so I highly encourage you to show up. There's nothing like seeing the damage in person to really help you get a sense of what's going on. And with that, uh, we can take any questions. I'd like to thank you for attending again this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks again, everybody. I, I will post this recording in the next couple of days on our Emerald Dashboard website as well. So uh, if you think of questions later, please feel free to reach out to us. Happy, happy to answer uh, whatever questions you have. OK, good question. Uh, typical lifespan of a healthy ash tree, you know, it, it, on average, I'd say it's about 80 years, you know. You know, maybe up to 100, but about about 80 years. So that's a, that's a good thing to take into account uh, if you're planning to treat an, an ash tree.
All right. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, thanks again for attending, and I will be posting the recorded uh, version of this meeting uh, in the near future. Thank you.